All right, today I'm going to talk to you about the glorious future of the Bride of Christ. Okay, thought this might be a really important study to do right now as, as the world has descended into idiocy and chaos and uh, things are not getting better. Uh, they're getting worse. The Bible says about the end times that evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Um, you're being lied to by the mainstream media and uh, it's not looking good right now. The world that we once lived in has changed. Even if things kind of come back a little bit, it's still going to be a different world. Um, life is never going to be the same again, and uh, unfortunately. But that's what the Bible te teaches would happen. But as a Christian, you have to look beyond this world. Um, you have to look and, and say, okay, what does the Lord have prepared for me in the future? If we get taken and uh, tortured or killed or whatever the thing is, what comes after, not just after this life, but what is coming in the future? Um, what, is, what is the future for the bride of Christ? And when you remember the scriptures, when you search the scriptures, if you're newly saved and you, and you might not have even heard some of this stuff about what the, the future is for the bride of Christ, these are some really important things, these scriptures to go through today. And we're going to go through a lot of scriptures. I want you to turn to your King James Bible. I want you to follow along and you're going to see that there is tremendous promises for you if you're a Christian. Okay, if you're a Christian, you are called the bride of Christ in scripture. All right. And understanding what a scriptural marriage is, the bride and the and the groom are one flesh, they're one body. So the Bible also calls you the body of Christ. There's a new number of titles for saved Christians. So we're going to get into these promises that are coming for the bride of Christ. And it is glorious. It is wonderful. And all these Satanists that are, that are behind this whole thing of, of this coronavirus scam and crashing the economy and hyperinflating the currency to destroy this nation and you know a lot of the other nations out there as well to bring in the mark of the beast, uh, one world currency. Um, these people don't have these glorious promises. Their promise is uh, going to be burning in the lake of fire for all of eternity after Revelation chapter 20, the great white throne judgment. Um, if they die before, you know, the, that final uh, judgment there, if, well, they aren't going to make it through the thousand year kingdom, but they're going to go to hell and they're going to burn. So the future of the lost world out there is not looking good. Okay. Lost people, if you're lost, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your savior, if you're not born again, your future is real bad, real bad. Even if you just become the, the best little docile little lamykins that just goes along with whatever the news media tells you to do and whatever the government and military martial law whatever if you go along with it your future stinks it's going to be horrible and you're going to die and go to hell okay especially when you take the mark of the beast when that time comes but um if you're going along with this whole system right now there's a real good chance you're going to be taking the mark of the beast in the future okay if you haven't woken up to what this whole thing's really about but if you're saved, let's look at the promises. Romans chapter 8. And like I said, there's a lot of scriptures we're going to go through today. This is going to be a big study. Romans chapter 8. And I'd tell you to go find a good local church in your area that would preach this. But the, oh, well, that's right. They closed their doors because the government told them to do so. Even though not one, you don't see any of that in here. The government says, you know, People in authority say, hey, you're not supposed to go and preach and teach in this name, the name of Jesus. Fine, whatever. Uh, we're, we ought to obey God rather than men. But the government comes out now and they say, shut your church, doors to your church building. Oh, yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. We'll do it right away. Almost like the churches of today aren't really scriptural. Almost. I wouldn't dare make a conclusion like that or anything. Romans chapter 8. Oh, there's the, there's the hateful thing again and all that stuff. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> Romans 8, uh, verse 14. We'll begin there. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Again, another one of the titles of a born-again Christian. You are a son of God. What is a son of God? Well, you go back to the Old Testament. The sons of God were angels. Okay? Now are we the sons of God? The Bible talks about in the New Testament. So... In the resurrection, 
they neither marry or nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. So um, when you are saved, you become basically a replacement for the sons of God that fell in the Old Testament. Again, another big study there. But uh, verse 15, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, like the TV media is trying to do to you if you watch television. But ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. The glory that comes to Jesus Christ, you're going to share in that if you're suffering right now. If you are a professing Christian, you're just going along with the world and you have received the spirit of, of fear that leads to bondage, you know, don't cough on me. Stay six feet away from me. Oh, oh, I might get it. I might get sick. You know what that is? It's a spirit of bondage, a spirit of fear, a spirit of fear that leads to bondage. Say it that way. I mean, who ever heard of this? And in, in, at any time in the history of the world, has there ever been a government that said, stay in your home, don't go out? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, oh. Put up a little plexiglass shield at, at the cash register there just in case somebody coughs. Somehow, magically, plexiglass keeps the virus from getting to you or something. Idiotic. Idiotic. And yet people are going along with it. Why? Because television is controlling their minds. That's why. As a Christian, you're led by the Holy Spirit of God. You walk around and you say, this is idiotic. This is stupid. This, doesn't, this isn't going to keep people from getting sick. And this coronavirus is not that much different than the flu. I've gotten the flu before. I've gotten pneumonia before. And I'm still here. I'm still alive. People can get sick. They can be healed with nutritional health. <laughs> Being in good nutrition, good natural health, I should say. There are natural cures and remedies for the flu and pneumonia. <laughs> but look at verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Boy, remember that one. The sufferings of this present time. Um, the stuff that we are being forced to do right now is ridiculous. But those sufferings that we go through right now are not worthy to com be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. We're going to be glorified together with Jesus Christ. Hmm. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Are you looking forward to getting a new body? I am. You looking forward to going to be with the Lord Jesus Christ and with all the saints? I am. Uh, Post-tribbers out there, the lost people that, that are, you know, they're not looking forward to this stuff. They're looking forward to seeing the Antichrist and the Mark of the Beast and all the other stuff. And they have to endure to the end to be saved and everything. Lost people go into that time. Saved people go up. More on that later. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willing, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Just a, it's a, when you really understand what this world's about, it's just suffering. <laughs> It always has been. There's always been bad times. There's been better times and, and times of more tyranny and whatever. But it's just a bad time here on this earth. Just the, the fact of the matter. Verse 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. You're a purchased possession. When God saves you, notice I said when God saves you, not when you save yourself with your intellectual belief. When God saves you, he has purchased you with his blood. Okay? And he is going to redeem you someday. The redemption of the purchased possession. Talks about that in Ephesians chapter 1. Very important to remember that. He's not going to lose you. Oh, the Antichrist showed up and, and, and he took a bunch of Christians and, you know, they, they went and took the mark of the beast you know, whatever, and all nuts. I lost them. I have to send them to hell, according to Revelation 14, verses 9 through 11. Ah, no, you know, weird systems of belief that people have. Verse 24, For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? 
But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it? I'm going to be doing another study here in, in a little while on that subject there, the thing of hope and, and you know, living by faith. And when you live by faith, it's things that you can't see. Okay? But uh, so I'll continue. I'll do that in another study. But verse 26, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Verse 28. Key verse for you if you are a Christian. All right, if you are born again, here's a key verse you always have to remember. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Everything that's going on right now is going to work together for good. Why? Well, the main reason is because it's all leading to the catching up of the body of Christ. Okay, that's the main thing. They can't bring just, you know, well, we'll just sit around and do nothing until the, the catching up happens. Many call the rapture. We, the Christians get called up and then the devil and his people get busy. They're busy right now. They want to bring in their little mark of the beast system. I mean, they only can run the thing for seven years, not even seven years. You know, a bunch of pathetic losers that they are. Be they Jesuits, Freemasons, whatever, Catholic knighthoods, whatever. Bunch of pathetic, satanic little losers that are going to burn in hell. Bunch of imbeciles. Okay. Let's work for hundreds of years to build something that will be dead in, in less than seven. Wow. You sure are brilliant with all your little PhDs and THDs and earned degrees and everything else. Fools. Fools. I, I, you know, I'm going to scheme and do all this stuff and whatever else in this life and little short life that I have so that I can burn in hell for all of eternity. Brilliant. <laughs> Verse 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. There you see it again. And predestination does not mean that God somehow picked you and forced you to be saved without any free will of your own to, to call upon the Lord to be saved. That's Calvinistic philosophy. Okay, Calvinism, Calvin was a, an idiot. John Calvin in the 16th century, uh, former Catholic, quote unquote, former Catholic. Um, he was a philosopher. That's all he was. And he came up with this idiotic system, if you're new to this whole thing. John Calvin came up with an idiotic system whereby God forces people to get saved and forces other people to go to hell. And they have no way that they can get saved. And yet he judges them and says, depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire. Well, <laughs> he created them that way. You know, it's, it's a stupid system of Calvinism. Predestination simply means in your King James Bible that when you get saved, your destination is fixed. You are predestinated, all right? You don't go to heaven as soon as you get saved. But that destination is there when you die. Or if the Lord catches you up, you know, at the at the resurrection. Okay, so that's the predestination there. Please don't let a Calvinistic philosopher confuse you on that. But uh, continuing here, verse 31. What shall we that then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Okay, another very important verse to remember there. Uh, it doesn't mean that nobody will ever be against you. It's not what it's saying. It's saying if God's for you, then... Who can be against us? Who really cares? You know, I mean, what's your relationship like with the uh, creator of the universe, the sustainer of all life? Well, I don't really know. I'm not really sure. I try my best. I live by the golden rule. <sighs> he wants to have a personal relationship with you. He wants to hear from you. He wants to see you humble yourself and uh, come to him as a, as a broken sinner, not as a self-righteous uh, know-it-all. Okay? Humble yourself before the Lord. Ask Him to save you. Verse 32, He that spared not His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is He that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who, sh who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Very important to remember that in these times. 
Verse 36, you say, oh, then good. Oh, the Lord's just going to protect us through any bad things. You're ignorant of church history. Let me show you. Verse 36, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. You know why America was founded? Oh, so we could all have brotherhood. We could, you know, the, the brotherhood of man, the fatherhood of God. Uh, no. <laughs> um, so we could come here and be prosperous. No. America was founded. A bunch of white separatists came over here and, and basically said, that's not a racist thing either, by the way, let me say that. But, you know, they came here, Europeans came here, and they said, we want to get away from Roman Catholic control, the Roman Catholic control of the European countries. We want to get away from that, the church state. That's why they came here. People forget that. That's the thing that we should be fighting for. We are all living out of bounds. If you are here in America, unless you're a Native American, uh, you don't belong here, okay, technically speaking. Then why are we here? To get away from religious, uh, a church religious, or a church political state. That's why we're here. And I find it interesting that you have uh, Jesuits basically in power right now in this country, and they're, they're forming rules and whatever else to, to take church and state and bring it to a whole new level. You know, faith-based initiative and faith-based this and faith-based that. It's very, very bad. But if you understand church history, you will understand that Christians have been persecuted and killed for centuries. Um, whole families rounded up and burned at the stake. Horrible, terrible tortures. You look at the Spanish Inquisition that the Catholics did to the Christians, and they'll deny it. It's, it's so funny, you know. Oh, we didn't do that. We didn't torture anybody. <laughs> Fox's Book of Martyrs isn't true. You know, okay. Yeah, uh, just the Bible says that these things happen. You know, that, that uh, Mystery Babylon in Revelation 17, colors are purple and scarlet, the Vatican, obviously. Um, and, it, and it says that she's drunken with the blood of the, the martyrs and saints of Jesus. And she will be in the future too, by the way. And the Catholics say, we didn't do anything. Uh, you know, well, what about this uh, Dewey Reams translation here from uh, 1610? Um, a year before the King James Bible came out, and it says about uh, killing the blood of, of heretics is no different than killing a murderer or a thief or whatever else. You know, I've showed the, the quote different times. Well, yeah, okay, we agree with that, but, you know, we're innocent. We don't kill people. <laughs> you know, Roman Catholics are, are bloody killers. Yeah, the ignorant ones lower down that they don't know what's going on a lot of times, but uh, when called upon by the Pope, you get a good radical pope in there, they'll be out killing Christians. Of course they will. What do you do about that? Verse 37, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. True for a Christian today, within what many call the church age, not true for the time of Jacob's trouble. There is a uh, man coming in the future, the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition. Again, he has many titles, the beast, Revelation 13. And he can separate somebody from the love of God, the love of Christ. How's that? If they take the, be take the mark, worship the beast in his image, they can't get saved. They're damned forever. In spite of what Kent Hovind and John MacArthur and a bunch of these other guys, which I've exposed over the years, in spite of what they've said. Well, I think somebody could take the mark and certainly God wouldn't be so mean that he would uh, force them to not take the mark. They, you know, they have to be able to provide for their families and things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll go on to the next passage here. Let me look at my notes. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. But you see it all through Romans chapter 8 there, all through the thing of the suffering that we go through as Christians. Um, it's there. It's just simply there. You can't, get, you can't escape that thing. And the suffering is just going to get worse and worse. I'd really like to see, you know, that last person get saved so that we can go home to be with the Lord. Really looking forward to that. Um, spending a lot more time down here on this earth just as... Not worth it. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. I'm thankful to those out there who have supported this ministry over the years and have uh, borne with me even in my folly. 
Uh, I've made some mistakes. I'm not perfect. Okay, I've done some stupid things. But uh, understand why I'm in ministry. It's not to get rich. Lord knows it's not to get rich. Okay, verse 2. Here's why. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. That is a big part of this ministry. I mean, I, obviously it's about Paul and Paul's writing to the Corinthians, but as a, as a preacher, that's my desire as well. I want to present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. That's why I come out with so many standards that people get mad about, you know, whatever. And I'm trying to get you to clean up your life. Sanctification. You know, a lot of people, they'll lie about me and say, well, you know, Denlinger teaches all these different works that you have to do to get saved or whatever. No, no, no. I teach them because you are saved and you're trying to clean up your life. That's what I'm trying to do. That's what Paul was trying to do. But what was going on back then? Look at verse 3. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which, we, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. I've seen that thing for years and years and years. And it just angers me, and I get mad, and, I, and I, I'll make videos and things, and I'm yelling and whatever else, and get angry, and, and you know people you know, point that stuff out and whatever else, but they don't understand the spirit behind it. They don't understand why I'm, I'm so vehemently against these false prophets out there. But you see it right here. It's going on in the first century. Look at this. If he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached... Do people today preach another Jesus? Why would you say those things? You called somebody a sissy? Jesus wouldn't have called somebody a sissy. sissy. My Jesus wouldn't have done that. What are they doing? They're preaching another Jesus. Okay? Uh, Jesus called people, you know, generation of vipers, you know, uh, whited sepulchers, you know, full of dead men's bones, uh, hypocrites, uh, you know, child of hell. I mean, Jesus was quite rough with the way he preached. But these people, well, my Jesus wouldn't do that. My Jesus loved people. My Jesus didn't judge people. They're preaching another Jesus. Or another spirit. Are there people out there that preach another spirit? Yeah. A lot of people try to preach that the Holy Spirit is a little bird that flies around. That's another spirit. That's not the Holy Spirit of God. Um, and also beyond that, uh, that the, the spirit that they are supposed to a preacher is supposed to have is a loving, just wishy-washy, little effeminate type of a thing. That's the Holy Spirit. You know, no, that's another spirit. Again, you read, read the Bible. You can see their sarcasm from Jesus, from Peter, from Paul. They're being sarcastic. They're getting people angry. They're being thrown in jail because of what they're preaching. A lot of people like to throw me in jail. Okay, watch out for little... Uh, uh, nice little preachers. They have it's a different spirit. How about another gospel? How about another gospel? Um, there's no repentance. There's no repentance involved with salvation. Repentance is just turning from unbelief to belief. <laughs> um, it's only believe. Just just believe. If you pray any kind of a prayer, then that's not salvation. You're you're trusting in your asking, not in your you know <laughs> you know. All these people, they're coming out with these false gospels. And I attack them. And I attack them by name. Why? Um, because I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Um, that's why I attack them. See, I want you to get to a point where your life is sanctified, where you can stand before Jesus Christ and not be ashamed. You know, if I had a daughter that was marrying age and there was a young man that was betrothed to her, I'm not going to say to her, hey, you just want to go out to town? Yeah, just go hang out with any girl you meet and whatever else. And um, they want to offer you a cigarette. Go ahead and take that and, you know, go out for a night on the town drinking and bar hopping and what? No, no, no. I want that girl of mine, my daughter, to be, pre be presented to her espoused husband one day as a chaste virgin chaste. You get that? She doesn't smoke. She doesn't drink. She doesn't chew. She doesn't go with them that do, like the old saying goes. 
Um, she's not messing around with, with covetousness. She's not has to, doesn't have to have the latest styles or some, you know, hairstyle that makes her look like a man or whatever, or dresses like a man. No, I want her to be a chaste virgin. And I want you to be a chaste virgin. So that when you get before the Lord Jesus Christ, you won't be ashamed. You can have a glorious future as the bride of Christ, but only if you follow the Word of God. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 27. I'll show you another thing here about this thing of the chaste virgin. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Did he give himself for a building? No. The church is his body. Again, please understand that. The church in the New Testament is never a building. Okay? Unless it's where the pagans were talking about the, the you know, their temple to the goddess Diana, and they call it a church. Very interesting. Pagans call their buildings churches. I'll say that one more time. Pagans call their buildings churches. Remember that? Verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he may present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that, that it should be holy and without blemish. I wouldn't listen to anybody on YouTube or any preacher out there if there's no standards of holiness that they present. If they just, well, you know, watch whatever you want on television, listen to whatever kind of music you want, marry whoever you want, dress however you want, whatever, where are the standards of holiness? Where are they? Are they trying to present you as a chaste virgin to Christ so that you can have a glorious future? I mean... Go back to my little analogy there. I have a daughter and there's a young man and a spouse to her. The young man comes and he shows up and uh, what's he want to find? He wants to find his wife. She's made herself ready for him. He doesn't want to come in there and smell some kind of drugs in the air or whatever else. She was smoking pot a little bit and there's some cigarette smell and she's, you know, whatever. And some guy goes running out of the bedroom before the husband comes and what. You see what I'm saying? That's a physical analogy, but you apply it to the spiritual. Okay? We as Christians are supposed to sanctify our lives and clean our lives up so that we're ready to meet Jesus Christ, so that we can have a glorious future. That young man comes in and he sees a, a, that his wife, his espoused wife, has been a harlot, but he loves her enough to say, okay, we'll get through this thing, whatever else. They're not going to have a real great marriage. But when you have a chaste virgin that's been there and she's, she's just really, really tried to, to you know, be ready for her husband, they're going to have a glorious future. <laughs> Next we're going to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Verse 17 through 21. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. That's a job of a, of a real preacher. I'm supposed to try out things on myself, on my family. And then if it works, I can tell you, hey, this works, do this. Okay? That's what I'm supposed to do. And you say, well, Brother Brian has proved this thing and his wife and whatever, you know, Sister Catherine and, and even their son Oliver, you know, they, they, they're practitioners of natural health. They, they you know, live off grid. They, they this, they that. Uh, it works good for them. Hey, we should try to do the same thing. I think it would help us out. Let's, let's consider these things. Um, you know, you just get down through the list, whatever there. Um, Verse 18, For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Notice that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Romans chapter 12 talks about, you know, presenting your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service. There is supposed to be sacrifice in your life. You're supposed to sacrifice the things of the world. The next verse in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, talks about be not conformed to this world. We're to be nonconformists. That's supposed to be there. They're the enemies, but these wicked people out there, they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. 
There's no sanctification there. Salvation is intellectual belief and nothing changes. They're enemies. But look, look, look at this. Look at the uh, rest of the verse here. Uh, oh, excuse me, verse 19. Um, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. They love the, the world. Therefore, they speak of the world. The world speaks of them. The world loves them. The world promotes their channel on YouTube. Yeah, I hear it all the time. Brother, I thought you weren't even doing any videos. And I, I had the notification little bell thing clicked and whatever else. I just figured you weren't doing videos anymore. Went and checked in on your channel and there's, you know, all kinds of sermons. YouTube's not notifying me. YouTube is, is deleting my comments. YouTube is not having your videos show up anymore. My, the salvation message that I did many, many, many years ago, it was the number one downloaded salvation message, the number one viewed salvation message. I typed it in the other day because sometimes I'll, I'll send people a link to it. And I typed it in the other day and literally it doesn't even come up in the search engine anymore. It's John Hagee and some other guy, uh, whatever else, you know, it's crazy. If you hear it crunching in the background, there's no moose walking up or whatever. It's my son riding his little ski bike thing. Go on. Um, but look at verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Oh boy, get a hold of that one. Verse 20, our conversation is in heaven heaven. We don't mind earthly things. We don't look and say, oh, well, you know, what's this, you know, oh, did you hear the latest on the corona, corona baloney virus thing and whatever? And what's this going to do to my retirement, my stocks and my, you know, you get these people that that's all they think about the worldly stuff. Our conversation is in heaven from whence also we look for the savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I tried to have grace for post-tribbers for a long time, and I'd say, I think some might be saved. I don't believe that way anymore. Okay, I've had to change my beliefs because I see their, the, the fruit of their system, their actions and things. Um, they're not looking for Jesus Christ. In fact, they get mad at you. Oh, you're just an escapist. Oh, you're going to be beamed up or whatever else. They get, they get really sarcastic. They hate the thought of having to look for Jesus Christ. They can't stand that. It's just... It, be right back. Okay, sorry about that. Um, but getting back to what I was saying, as a Christian, you're looking for Jesus Christ. You're excited. You want to see Jesus. Okay? The glorious future of the bride of Christ. A bride looks forward to seeing her espoused husband. She doesn't say, well, you know, whenever he comes, I don't really care. Uh, you know, eh, whatever. Yeah, we'll get married, I guess. Kind of. You know, eh, whatever. No, 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 no. She's counting the days. She's looking for her husband to come. She can't wait to see him. Why? She loves him. You see, true love produces that, that anxious, you know, feeling there. But I just can't wait to see him. And I'll tell you right now, if there's, if there's anything else that you'd rather do than see Jesus Christ, you're out of fellowship with the Lord. I didn't say you're lost. Okay. Cause all of us, you, you know, you can leave your first love and whatever else. Sure. But if there's, if there's things that are in your mind, oh, I just wanted to go here, or I just wanted to do this, or whatever else, I'm not talking service to the Lord, okay? There's, there's projects that we all have that we want to see things happen or see people get saved. That's fine. But I'm saying if there's things in this world, vacation spots, or you want to get a bigger house, or you know, covetousness, in other words, and you're putting that before Jesus Christ, repent, okay? You need to repent. Look for Jesus Christ. But... Um, Verse 21, who shall change our vile body? Do you believe that your body is vile? Do you look at yourself as being vile? Do you struggle with the flesh? Again, most of these post-tribbers I've ever dealt with, they don't consider themselves to be vile. You know, they're, they're actually looking forward to seeing the Antichrist so that they can prove just how holy they are. And they'll look at you as a pre-tribber and they'll say, Oh, you're not going to be able to stand the way that I can. And you're going to fall away because you were looking for Jesus and, and not looking for the Antichrist. And you're going, to, you're going to fall away from the faith and this. And, you know, I'm not going to. 
I'm ready to see the Antichrist and to fight the New World Order and everything else. Mm -hmm. They don't. They aren't looking forward to having their vile body changed. Because to them, their body isn't vile. They're lost. But let's continue. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 15. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. <laughs> Sorry, John Calvin. Idiot John Calvin. Fool. Lost. Burning in hell right now, John Calvin. It's appeared to all men. Well, he would say, well, all men meaning the elect. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but look at this. Verse 12. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us. You get saved, that grace of God teaches you something. What does it teach you? That you can just go on and live your life and enjoy yourself and don't worry about this sanctification stuff and you can just do whatever you want. It's not what it says in the text. Read in your King James Bible. Read it. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. Hmm, holiness? Yeah. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. You got saved, did you? Um, how much of that are you practicing? Denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. Denying it. Nonconformity. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. I see these uh, Bathlicks and they'll, they'll do this thing if they get in their little church building and they, they run and scream and they're, you know, jumping up and down and acting like crazed individuals and whatever else. And, and they say, oh, I'm just enjoying my salvation. Uh, chapter and verse, please. You're not living soberly. And you look at uh, Titus chapter 2 here and you go down through, you know, verses 1 um, down to 10 actually. Uh, you get down through those verses, it's just sober, 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 sobriety, be sober, soberly. People losing control of themselves and whatever else. And I've been in those Baptist churches, by the way, and the ones that scream the loudest, Amen! Woo! You know, and they're screaming and pulling their tie off and th throwing hymn books and stuff. I've been in those types of places. I've seen them running around and whatever else. And you know what? Every case, those guys are the ones that have all kinds of flesh problems. I remember being in a church, one of these, you know, bad attitude Baptist churches one time and uh, the pastor, Mike Collingwood, and he actually said, oftentimes the guys that scream the loudest are the ones that were looking at pornography the night before the service. Bam, kick you. Mm -hmm. He knew some of what was going on. Yeah, uh, soberly. Might do another study on that sometime in the future, but uh, we're supposed to be different from the lost world. Why? Well, because we have a glorious future ahead of us that we need to be prepared for. We need to start getting ready for it right now. Well, I'm just going to get saved and I'm just going to go do the things that Jesus had to die a horrible death for. I'm just going to go do those things that he hates. And I'm just going to live my life like the rest of the lost world. And then when I get saved or when, I, when he calls me up, catches me up at the resurrection, then I'll just kind of be holy then. Then I'll be changed. You know, what about the judgment seat of Christ? Yeah, Whatever. I might, you know, as long as I get to heaven, that's all I care about, brother. You're a fool. You have a glorious future ahead of you if you're saved. Get ready for it. Prepare yourself for it. Verse 13, Titus chapter 2, verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. One and the same, by the way. The great God is our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's just giving two different titles for the same being. Okay, There's no great God over here and in our Savior, Jesus Christ, over there, like the Trinitarians believe. Okay, It's just two titles for the same being. But think about it. I mean, you know, and you say, oh, I don't believe that. Okay, we're called up together to meet who in the air? Jesus. Looking for the appearing of who? There's going to be two there when we get there. Just one. But think about it again. How do you do this? How do you get through this thing if you're a postie? <clears throat> of course, I know what they would say. They would say, well, um, 
we are going to see the Antichrist first, but then eventually we're going to see Jesus. So we're still looking forward to Jesus. Okay, but you can time it out. You can time it out if you're a post-tribber. You see the Antichrist show up on the world scene. He's confirmed the covenant between the Catholics and Israel, which is what the Bible teaches there and as far as uh, Mystery Babylon and the nation of Israel. And the Antichrist confirms that thing. Well, you can time it out. We've got three and a half years. So it's not really looking for, you know, the Lord. You're looking for the Antichrist so that you can say, okay, now we've got three and a half years. <laughs> Crazy. <clears throat> But look at the look at verse 13 again. Read that to get into the context of verse 14. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. Himself? Well, that's singular. If you're a Trinitarian, you say with well, the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, the Father and Jesus, you know, God the Father, God the Son, you know, um, then why does it say who gave himself for us? So, well, it's, it's switching the, the subject to Jesus and whatever. You people get desperate. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Well, well then you should be able to preach in such a way that people won't hate you. That's not what it's saying. When it says, let no man despise thee, it's just simply saying, uh, let nobody speak down to you to the point where they shame you and you say, well, okay, I'm sorry, I shouldn't, you know. I'm supposed to preach and rebuke. That's what I'm supposed to do. Why? That I may present you as a chaste virgin to Jesus Christ. You have a glorious future. Remember that, Christian. No matter what happens on this earth, your conversation is to be in heaven. You're looking for Jesus. This stuff that's happening right now in the police state and everything else, all this nonsense, it should excite you. You should look and say, we might be going home soon. My husband might be coming soon to redeem the purchased possession. Boy, it's getting exciting. Oh, but what if they destroy the economy? Good, we're one step closer. <clears throat> Doesn't mean you shouldn't get mad about it. Certainly, you can get mad about it. First Thessalonians chapter four. <clears throat> you know the Bible talks about. You know Jesus said, "Woe unto the world because of offenses, for offenses must needs come, but woe to the man by whom they, the offense cometh." Um, he got mad about the the you know the sickening, you know degradation of the world. I mean, he came knowing he was going to die. It wasn't some kind of thing that was hid from Jesus and he later found out or whatever. He knew what was going to happen the whole time. And it vexed his, him, him seeing these Pharisees and Sadducees and them controlling the people and whatever else. It, it vexed the Lord, certainly. But he looked for those eternal things and we need to do the same. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, verse 16 Start reading here. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. That's the next big spiritual event that will happen. Okay? Um, again, you get this thing. Uh, you know, there isn't a sense of imminency in the in terms of the catching up of the body of Christ, sure, that's there. But you get these people saying that there are no signs that are before, you know, the, the rapture. They'll say that. Oh, that's not true. Okay, there is going to come a falling away first, all right, before the man of sin is revealed. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. And, you know, in the last days, perilous times shall come. Okay, there are bad times coming. That's what the Bible teaches. The Antichrist system is being set up. So as we see that stuff getting closer, we know the Lord's going to come, you know, at some point in time here. So, you know, look out for that teaching as well, that there are no signs before the, the rapture. Well, I understand that partly. There are no supernatural signs in terms of the Lord, uh, you know, appearing or something like that. That's true. But uh, the falling apart of society, yeah, that's 
one of the big ones that's there that the Bible talks about in the end times and we get caught up at some point in time there, you know, in the future. But uh, the whole point is there's a comfort there because we're going to get to go see Jesus Christ. And that's what you have to remember. As bad as times are going to get, and they're just going to get worse now. Sorry, we're not going to go back to the way the world once was. Um, and you say, well, they're going to print, you know, currency. That's another thing I need to kick here for a minute. They're going to print uh, all kinds of money. They're going to print trillions of dollars. Yeah, that leads to hyperinflation. Okay, look at Zimbabwe. All right, uh, look at the Weimar Republic in Germany before Hitler showed up. Okay, that's what they're doing. Hitler was a dry run, okay, for the Antichrist. All right, um, he's the greatest type of Antichrist in our modern history. The man had a great ability for oration. People worshipped him you know, and his image, uh, certainly that stuff's all there. And, you know, he didn't require people to take a mark per se, but he put, you know, uh, serial numbers on people. Uh, that wasn't really a common practice before Hitler did it. And, uh, he also put armed bands on the Nazis and armed bands on the Jews. So there was marking of people. So they, they dry, you know, did a little dry run there, a test operation with Adolf Hitler. And, you know, had they had television in every home, um, they could have probably had Hitler take over the world because he was a papist. You know, they, the Catholics signed the uh, concordat with uh, Nazi Germany before the whole war started. So, again, it was a Vatican operation, plain and simple. I mean, again, I've proved that in other studies. But when the Antichrist comes, they're going to have people glued to their television Kind of like right now, you know, forcing people to stay at home and watch TV. Hmm, how about that? Um, Big Pharma is the one that's behind this whole scam. They're getting people just chomping at the bit for a vaccine to the coronavirus. And once they get their vaccine, then they'll be able to say, oh, hey, we can finally keep you safe because you have to stay home until the last person. You know, there, there can't be any more coronavirus people out there or whatever else before we can restore the world the way it once was. I mean, the thing's just such a stinking scam. And you know what they're going to do. They're going to bring out the whole vaccine thing, and then they're going to say you have to be vaccinated, and if you're not, then you're an anti-vaxxer or whatever else. And let me just let me just make a statement. I'm going to be saying this in a couple videos. If you are one of these people that's just, you know, one of Satan's servants that's just into this whole thing, the coronavirus thing or whatever, and you say people are dying and how dare you, you should, your channel should be shut down. I'm going to report you to YouTube. You will be instantly blocked and your comment deleted. Okay. Report me to YouTube, whatever. I don't care. You know, YouTube, uh, they're not going to touch this channel until the Lord says, okay, Brian's preached enough. Then they can take the channel down. But until then, I don't care how many times you flag my video or whatever else, it's not going to be taken down. But if you put that kind of nonsense in there, you dark age Catholic, you would burn them at the stake, burn the heretic. It's the same mindset, just a modern you know, variant of it. But if you do that, instantly you are blocked from the channel. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're a longtime supporter. If you're for this whole coronavirus thing and say that your channel is going to be blocked and whatever, you know, I, you, you need to be silenced or something. Boom, you're done. You're finished. Let's continue here. Chapter five. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Okay, and I've preached through this thing for years and years and years. Um, you see the distinction in chapter 5 between saved, there, verse 1 and 2, ye, you, yourselves, and lost, in verse 3, they, them, they. Okay, and you'll see this thing all throughout the next number of verses here. It's talking about the distinction between saved and lost. And there's saved people that escape, and there's lost people who don't. That's very important to remember that. But what are people saying right now? They want peace and safety. Safety from the evil coronavirus that can get you and just kill you in a matter of days or something. <laughs> you know, just... There's a lot of cures out there. Again, a lot of these people judge me for my baloney virus uh, video and the death of free will study I did. And yet they don't even watch to the end to see the actual cures that I give for flu type of symptoms. They're, they're so concerned with what I'm saying and yet they don't care about the cures that I give at the end. I don't care about people. I just give the cures, the natural cures with no side effects. 
at the end. But I don't care about people. Yeah. Verse 4, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. We're not in darkness. We know what's coming. Why? Because we remember the glorious future of the bride of Christ, remember? Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, there's that word again, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Very important. Verse 10, who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. And I, I love that. I see a lot of you, the faithful brethren out there, and you comfort each other and you edify one another. I see it in the comments. I, I know that you're contacting each other off of the outside of the comment thing. You're talking on Skype. You're, you're fellowshipping. Some of you fellowship in person. Praise the Lord for it. Be a comfort one to another. And by the way, let me just say this. Um, if you know people in your local area that you're meeting with, um, don't submit to the government for one second when it comes to the thing of fellowshipping together. You say, well, well but brother so-and-so, he actually has the coronavirus. Okay, then get some natural cures and go to his house and help heal him. Oh, but what if the government finds out? Who cares? They put Christians in, in prison in the first century. Remember that. And the Lord was breaking them out of prison and saying, go back and preach on the street again. They were considered to be quite lawless back then. All this fear stuff, you know. Just incredible. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that was sat, and he that sat was look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Again, these people, the posties, there's not one verse of Scripture that, that proves a pre-trib rapture. Um, John was taken up. Was John saved? He was taken up before the uh, <clears throat> tribulation started, before the Antichrist is even unleashed in Revelation 6. It's, it's just that simple. There is no debate, okay? Well, I don't believe in the pre-trib fib. Well, go to hell. That's where you're headed. I'm not swearing. I'm just telling you, go to hell because that's where you're going. You don't believe in the pre-trib rapture. You don't believe in the resurrection being before the, the Lord pours out his, his judgment on this earth. You don't, you don't know the Lord. It's just that simple. So, you know, uh, if you're confused, that's one thing. But if you're, you know, militantly defending this whole post-trib thing, you're lost. You're on your way to hell. It's, I mean, it's, it's just so simple. John went up before the Antichrist is unleashed. There's 24 elders up there. There's a great, you know, un, you know, 200, uh, uh, 10 times, 10,000 times 10,000, thousands of thousands of angels around about the throne. Save Christians in heaven before the Antichrist is unleashed. God never ever judges righteous people uh, with the wicked. Okay. He never does it. He never pours out his judgment and his wrath on righteous people. If he did, he would be unrighteous. Watch my uh, um, false god of post-trib Christians study for more information on that. Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 through 14. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Promises for Christians. Verse 11, And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing, 
and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all them and all that are in them heard I saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshiped him that liveth forever and ever. Are you looking forward to worshiping the Lord in heaven? Yep, I am. Um, I wouldn't walk in a church building right now if my life depended on it. <laughs> okay, I'd probably go look for help in a bar first or something. I mean, I, well, I wouldn't go there either. I'd just go out into the woods or something, you know, find what I need. But, uh, I wouldn't walk, I will not darken the door of a church building for any reason at all. Why? There's so many fakes in them, in those places. So many fraudulent people. In fact, I'd say most of them are fraudulent. They're lost, you know, you know, false converts and whatever. Um, but I sure am looking forward to actually being with the true, genuinely saved saints and worshiping the Lord forever and ever. I can't wait. There'll be, there'll be no uh, hypocrites up there, no infiltrators and whatever else. If you read about in the book of Galatians, they were infiltrating back then. False brethren brought in unawares, spy out our liberty. Yeah, <laughs> it's going to be great when we finally get to heaven. I might say it's a, a glorious future. Know what I mean? Revelation chapter 12, here's another good one. Revelation chapter 12. Verse 7 through 12. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and, night, day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. You say, well, how, what is that, you know, how does that deal with the, uh, the glorious future of the bride of Christ? Very simple, because when we get to heaven, it isn't just going to be, you know, this, this lovey, you know, yay, happy, oh, you know, there's going to be war up there. We're going to get to fight. Don't you love that? You're going to get to see the devil. You say, what, what did you, uh, what, huh, huh, what did you say? No, the devil's down in hell. He sits on a, on a throne with fire around him, like Jack Chick drew. Uh, no, I don't think so. The devil's not in hell. The devil's in heaven. What? The devil is not in hell. He gets cast there in Revelation chapter 20. We'll be reading that here in a little bit. Um, he's not down there right now. He doesn't want to go there. Okay? He's up in heaven. Uh, what's it say there? Let me get the exact wording. Um, Accuse them before God day and night. The accuser of our brethren is cast down. Verse 10, Revelation chapter 12. He's accusing you. He's watching everything that you do. His little agents out there, the other devils, they're reporting back to him and he's saying, hey, did you see what they did? You need to punish them for that. And, and this is wrong. And it, He's up there, a little prosecuting attorney or whatever. Jesus is our defense attorney, so don't worry about it. He's a lot smarter. Um, and the devil's up there and he's just accusing and accusing and accusing and accusing. A little jerk that he is. And we're going to get up there and we're going to see him. How about that? Um, how about that for your little uh, Jack Chick drawing, drawings and whatever kind of other people that try to draw things in heaven, even though the Bible says not to. And you get up there and, and you you walk and oh, it's the Lord and you're talking to all the saints and everything. And all of a sudden you look over and there's this guy standing there, just a sour look on his face. And you go, oh, hi, Satan, you know, Whatever. And about that time, Lord says, okay, time for the judgment seat of Christ. Come on, let's go on over here. We're going to have rewards. Uh, watch Satan and the angels. And they're over there. To... <laughs> about that time, there's some words get started, and probably some shoving and whatever else. And, <laughs> and then the fight starts. It's going to be wonderful, you know. 
<laughs> part of the glorious future, you know, the body of Christ there, the bride of Christ. And um, I'm going to be up there and cast him down, whew, down to the earth. Your uh, time is short. And um, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Times are going to be bad for you now the devil's down there. You looking forward to that? Well, I just don't know if I've ever heard any preacher preach this way before, and I don't just don't think that we should be talking about these subjects, and and that we should be concerned more about love. And you know, <laughs> if you're saved, you know you're, you're looking forward to this. I can't wait. You know, get up there and and uh, I don't know who's going to throw the first punch or the you know spit in the devil's face the first or whatever else, but I'm going to try to get a hit or two in on that idiot up there. Oh, it's going to be low. oh man. Can we go now, you know? <laughs> Revelation 14. Boy, I'm looking forward to it. Revelation 14, verse 1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. Interesting. Um talking over with the brother and, and um, brother Jacob and, and he was saying about that the father and the son and the Holy Spirit when they speak it's kind of like a multitude of, of voices that you're hearing you know kind of written about right there of many waters hmm very interesting uh, verse 3 and they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and I'm saying body soul spirit speaking not three separate persons and they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn the, that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. Um, can you imagine what it's actually going to be like to get there into heaven and to hear the Lord being praised in song? Type, type of singing we've never even heard down here on the earth. Can you imagine that? You know, get up there and all the glory of heaven and... and Finally, fellowshipping with the saints, the truly saved saints. You get to see Jesus for the first time. And uh, we get to have a good fight, kick the devil out of heaven. And then they're singing. And we're singing too in Revelation chapter 5, which is going to be great. You know, you can imagine the devil over there, you know, the Lord says, sing. You know, and he's, thou art worthy to redeem. <laughs> you see these people, I remember going to church and you see these people, they're not singing or whatever sour you know faces that's gonna be the devil in heaven then we kick him out and then we have more singing it's gonna be great glorious future brethren revelation chapter 15 and i saw another sign in heaven great and marvelous seven angels having the seven last plagues for in them is filled up the wrath of god and I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. And after that I looked and behold the tabernacle of the the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened and the seven angels came out of the temple having the seven plagues clothed in pure and white linen and having their breasts girded with golden girdles and one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who liveth forever and ever and the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled Broadway musicals, sorry, cheap imitation of what's coming. Opera, London Philharmonic Symphony Orchestra, cheap imitation. Just all cheap imitations of what the Lord has prepared for them that love him. For his uh, bride. Not only are we going to get to have a fight in heaven and, and the judgment seat of Christ and everything else, but there's going to be musicals and, and all kinds of entertainment up there that are just going to blow your mind, you know. People not coming out with, you know, gold-plated, uh, gold, pure gold vials, pure gold girdles, pure gold this, and fine linen, and whatever else. It is going to be just mind-boggling what the Lord has prepared for them that love Him. 
you know, you think about, you know, the Lord is prepared for them to love them. You think about the rewards and the mansion and whatever, you know, think about that stuff. And, uh, you know, that stuff's there. But uh, even just the things that we're going to see when we get there, the performances, the shows, the singing, the fighting. Oh, man. <laughs> Glorious future, brethren. Glorious. Revelation 19. Revelation 19, verses 1 through 9. And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. More praising, more worshiping, more singing, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. And why? Well, Revelation 17 and 18, the Roman Catholic Church is destroyed. And we're up in heaven throwing a party. You looking forward to that? I am. I'd love to be able to destroy the Catholic Church down here, but I know it's not going to happen. I know that as much as work as I do and whatever else, I'm not going to destroy the Catholic Church. Never going to happen. That's the Lord's job. That's up to Him. But I sure am going to celebrate when I see it happening. No more of these pervert priests molesting little children. No more Jesuits. Looking forward to it. Verse 2. For true and righteous are His judgments, for He hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude and as the voice of many waters, there it is again, as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. A lot of people try to copy that in this world they try to copy the thing of a bride dressed in white and whatever else and there's been some you know pretty amazing weddings i would say down here on the earth but not like what's going to be in heaven for you if you're a member of that bride of christ you have a glorious future ahead of you don't forget that don't take your eyes off of jesus christ and look at this wicked world and just think oh and get filled with a, a spirit of fear that brings bondage Oh, they're telling me I can't this and that. Well, the Bible says I can. Sorry. See ya. I'm going to go live my life. I'm going to go do what I can for the Lord. I'm going to go do what I can to try to get that last person saved so we can see this stuff happen. Get up there to be with the Lord and now we're safe. Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. And cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them. And judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Um, don't let anybody talk you into anything other than premillennial, premillennialism, or uh, people uh, ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ for the thousand years. Jesus will be on the earth for one thousand years ruling and reigning from Jerusalem. Okay, that's what the Bible teaches. Post-millennial post -millennial people that say that we're going to bring in a kingdom and Jesus comes back at the end to see how good a job we did, they're lost and they're also idiots. Okay, uh, man has never been able to, to have a kingdom last for more than about 300 years or so. Okay, um, and America is about ready to fall, so, and we're not near 300 years. Okay, 1776, you know, we're not going to make it to 2076 in this nation. <laughs> I don't know if we'll make it to 2021. All right. 
Uh, Post-millennialism is stupid, and amillennialism is not much better that there is no thousand years, uh, you know, reign of Jesus Christ. We're kind of just in this uh, kingdom thing right now or whatever else. Ridiculous. But uh, don't fall for that stuff. Um, verse 5, but the rest of the dead, dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. You can see my study on that um, to understand what the first resurrection is about. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Okay? Reign with, reigning with Jesus Christ a thousand years. We're going to go back to the book of Isaiah. We have all this good stuff to do, and uh, we're going to be there and, and everything up in heaven, and then we actually come back down to the earth. Uh, that's why the Lord in, in John chapter 10 talks about, you know, leading his sheep in and out and finding pasture. Okay. Uh, we are his sheep. His sheep hear his voice. And he's going to take us up to heaven and then all the neat stuff that happens up there. And then we come back down here for the reception, so to speak. We get married in heaven there in Revelation 19. We just read it not long ago. Come back down to the earth and we're there. And I did a whole study on the marriage supper of the Lamb if you want to see that an older study. You can just search it on my channel. We come back down to the earth and the devil tries to sneak into the marriage supper, into the uh, reception, so to speak. And the Lord says, bind him hand and foot, which is what you read about in Revelation 20. He's bound with a chain, sent down there and shut up for a thousand years. I kind of like that little implication. Shut up, Satan. <laughs> Go down there. But um, Isaiah chapter 11 so we have marriage in heaven, sort of the reception on earth, and then what happens? A thousand years. This is what we read about here. Isaiah 11, verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. Read Revelation chapter 19. All the stuff ties together. He slays the Antichrist army. A sword comes out of his mouth and he slays them. Just wipes them out. <clears throat> Verse 5. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. That's what it's always said, by the way, too. Don't worry about this Mandela effect stuff. Oh, it's lying in the lamb that lay down. No, it isn't. It's never been that in the King James Bible. New versions read that way. If I remember correctly, these new versions bring out these new readings. And then this Mandela effect thing comes out and they say, oh, look, see, it used to say this. It never did. Okay. It never said lion and lamb. It was always wolf and lamb. Don't fall for that. And the leopard shall lie down with the kid and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the suckling child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. Hmm. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the, recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, and from Egypt, and from Pathros, and from Cush, and from Elam, and from Shinar, and from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. Okay. Right now, I'm not too worried about a bear. Here in the woods okay they are in this area certainly but they're still hibernating so not really worried about that um some big bull moose could have an attitude and whatever else and and uh you know there's some uh bobcats around and whatever else and there, there's a few wild animals most of them just leave you alone but if you're in alaska you know you got grizzly bears there and you got wolves and whatever else if you're in africa where well, you have lions to worry about and other things and you know, if you're down south someplace where you have poisonous snakes, we don't have poisonous snakes here, which I'm thankful for. <laughs> I'd rather deal with bears and angry moose than, than poisonous snakes. Uh, not into that. Um, 
but uh, not in the thousand year kingdom. Oh, look, here comes a big bull moose. Hey, come here, boy. Come here, boy. Hey, you, want a, you want an apple? Let me pick one off the tree. Here you go, boy. Oh, here comes a bear. Oh, hey, uh, son, you want to take a ride on the bear today? Oh, here comes a lion. Here's a pack of wolves coming. Come here, boy. Come here. Come on. Glorious future. Isn't that going to be neat? Isn't that going to be neat? I got it out that time. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, brother, things are really going bad. I know. I know. But remember your glorious future if you're saved. If you're lost and you're still watching this thing, um, what on earth are you waiting for? You want to just take your chances, keep taking your chances, not getting saved and, and die and miss everything, go to hell for all of eternity, miss out on these precious promises that are recorded in the King James Bible? Man, why would you do that? Get saved. So important. Make it happen. Two more places to turn to. Revelation chapter 20. Back to the book of Revelation. See more of the glorious future that lies before us. I mean, I can't even fathom what it's going to be like. You know, you get back here after the devil's messed things up so bad. You know, in the time of Jacob's trouble, it's already starting. You know, you can see it heading that way, the mark of the beast system and whatever else. And get back here after the Lord just wrecks the earth and watch the Lord just restore things. And get down here and for a thousand years we're back here on the earth again ruling and reigning with jesus christ no rock music in the grocery store no porno pornographic stuff or whatever else no internet no electricity no whatever just just down here praising and worshiping the lord agrarian lifestyle meaning we grow food and you know raise animals and stuff like that that's agrarian okay <laughs> No big tractors, no big logging machines to come and rape the forests and, and destroy the wildlife and whatever else. And, and they do. I'm a I'm former logger myself, but the, the way that they log trees now is just atrocious. Log a, a forest and then come in and spray glyphosate to kill off the, the, the bad things so that you can regrow the trees much quicker so you're going to get timber again, you know, fast. It's what's done here in northern Maine like crazy and then then the animals come along and they eat the plants like they normally would like god designed them to do and then they die a terrible death that's not going to be there in the future not going to be any more reports of catholics molesting children not going to be there jesuits scheming not going to happen i'm looking forward to that there's a lot of things i'm looking forward to here's another one revelation chapter 20 verses 10 through 15 and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a white, great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works." And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. Interesting. Oh, I'm judged, you know, about how good a person I am and whatever. Well, you're absolutely right. These lost people out there. I don't think I'm a bad person. I think that my works will someday be weighed and whatever. They will be. They will be. They will be judged according to their works. And they're going to be found that they didn't, you know, couldn't possibly earn salvation on their own with their own self-righteousness. That's why they go to hell and then the lake of fire for all of eternity. Verse 14, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You say, how's that glorious? Um, <clears throat> because right now the evil people that seem to be getting away with murder, um, they're going to be there at the great white throne judgment. All the wicked perverts out in Hollywood that uh, say they're Antichrist type of things and sing Imagine by John Lennon and uh, just continue to warp and pervert the youth and everything else. We're going to see him at the Great White Throne Judgment. Hey, uh, there's Adolf Hitler. Comes up, standing there before he's cast in the lake of fire. Lord judges him. We'll see him. Every pope that's ever lived. Every Hollywood celebrity. All the famous. All the all the presidents of America and whatever else and all these 
political leaders and all the Jesuit philosophers and all the little Jesuit priests and everything else, all these, these imps right now that the devil is using to destroy this world and to bring in, usher in the mark of the beast system. We're going to see them all. Every single last one of them. And we get to see the devil too there again. You know, I hope we get to wave, you know. <laughs> Bye! <laughs> oh boy, looking forward to that. And uh, I'm going to give you a little assignment. Okay? Not going to give you a test or anything, but uh, I want you to read Revelation chapter 21 and chapter 22 on your own. Get done with this, this video and just, you know, if you're not looking forward to this stuff, be zealous and repent. Okay? Get back to looking for Jesus Christ and say, you know, get that excitement. He's coming soon. He's coming soon. Lord, what can I do? What do you want me to do with the time I have left? Because I sure am looking forward to these promises. And then read Revelation chapter 21 and chapter 22 and look and see what the future holds after the thousand year kingdom. We go to be with the Lord for all of eternity. What's it going to be like in heaven? Talk about the uh, glorious promises and things for the bride of Christ. It's going to be amazing. Absolutely amazing. And you read that stuff and you think on these things and the devil's not going to be able to control you through the fear that he's currently bringing to this world and the paranoia. That's what this whole study is about. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim. Got to remember that, brethren. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I do thank you for the precious promises that are in your word. I thank you for that glory that will one day be revealed in us. And I pray, Lord, that you would help me to remember, and everybody else that's watching this, that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. Lord, I, I pray that uh, you keep us focused on you and on your word. And um, if there are people that need to be saved and, and someone that's watching this video is going to be the one that leads them to you, then I pray that you would please open that door, that opportunity, Lord. Help us put the track down. Bring up a conversation, whatever it is, Lord. But let's just, just please, Lord, help us to get that one last person saved. Maybe somebody that's watching this right now, Lord, they're not saved. They're not born again. Please, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would strive with their spirit. Break down their self-righteousness and help them to come to you as a broken sinner and uh, in need of salvation. Call upon you, Lord, and, and ask you to save them. And Lord, I pr just pray that you would help us not to get drawn into the fear that Satan is spreading across this world right now. And I ask it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, that's going to be it for this study. Bigger study. Doesn't hurt, though. <laughs> uh, just got to remember this stuff. And I'm um, going to be doing a bunch of other videos here. But I just really felt pressed of the Lord to put this thing out. Um, because it's just... What's going on in our world right now has just got me so irritated and so ticked off and everything else. Um, you know, and you know, you can feel the spirit of fear just comes up occasionally and you just kind of think, oh, what if they do this? What if they do that? You just got to turn your eyes upon Jesus. Remember the promises that we have. So that is going to be it. Like I said, I'm going to be doing a bunch more studies and I'm going to be driving to the office and uploading them, regardless of the stay-at-home orders, because they're ridiculous and stupid. And if I had brethren that I was going to go fellowship with, I would go and fellowship with them. I'm not a slave. I'm a free man, and Jesus Christ keeps me free. Um, if I had brethren in the area, like I said, that I was going to, hey, we got a fellowship, or whatever, go fellowship with them. You know, you get stopped or pulled over, whatever else, I'm going shopping, you know. Um, I have to go out and take care of some important things. Um, they're destroying the economy with this. Remember that. Your life is being threatened right now. Um, that's what they're doing. If you submit to this thing, I mean, what are they going to do next? You know, say, the only way that we can truly stop the coronavirus is for everybody to stop breathing. 
Okay, so now it's all gathered together and let's all take our one last breath. <gasps> okay, stop. Well, you know, there'd be people that'd be dumb enough probably to do it. Fall over dead. <laughs> hey, I saved America, you know, because I, I stopped breathing. <laughs> they do not have a right to come and tell you what to do with your life. It's just that simple. Um, and if they take my channel down, it's only because God allowed them to. It's just that simple. Let's not fear men. Okay? Please remember that. Uh, thank you to everybody out there that supports the ministry. Thank you to all those who pray for us. Um, I guess that's about it. There's a whole lot more I could say, but that'll be for future studies. So we will see you in the next video. King James Video Ministries has been faithfully preaching and teaching from God's Word since 2008. Our YouTube channel has never been monetized, and we do not accept money from the lost world because this would violate the scriptures. King James Video Ministries is supported by saved brethren in accordance with 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 through 18. If you have been blessed by our videos, we would ask that you prayerfully consider supporting this ministry financially. You can donate online by visiting www.kingjamesvideoministries.com or by sending a check or money order to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 214, Patton, Maine, 04765. Thank you to all who donate to this ministry, and we pray for the Lord's blessing in your lives.